was asked to talk today for a few minutes about a program we've been piloting at Aronda Quaid High School with the help of the RIT Microelectronics Department on integrating semiconductors and microelectronics in high school science courses. It seems strange to me that as much as our society is becoming more and more technical, more and more based on computers, how little we actually talk about microelectronics and semiconductors, at least as far as the standard curriculum you'll pick up off of most people's, uh, most people's desks. And it's really not that difficult to integrate basic understanding of semiconductors and microelectronics in just a couple weeks without getting deep into any of the quantum or device qualitative analysis. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that program. So a general idea, I'll talk about what microelectronic engineering is, and we're really lucky here in Rochester, a couple hundred yards in this direction, we have a microelectronic engineering department and I've been involved with them for about 10 years now. Um, we'll talk about some of their outreach initiatives in microelectronics and how this program started. The Semiconductor Technology Enrichment Program, a step that's a lot shorter, uh, which is how we incorporate this in high schools, and what we're trying to do, the future directions, what the uh, goal of the program is. So what is microelectronics? That's probably a goofy question for this crowd because you guys are probably more tuned into this than most groups by far. Um, 25 years from now, people may look back at the 50 years preceding this and say, man, this was such an innovative time. Things were growing so quickly. You even look back, 1947, transistors. What's that, 50, 60 years now, a little over 60 years? And we have millions, millions of transistors on things smaller than fingernails. And they work. Absolutely amazing to me. And these are going into more than just computers now. Cell phones, magnetoelectronics, polymer electronics, the heads-up displays, the transparent conductors. Almost all the TVs that you see now are all transistors over the entire front panel, the flat panel TVs, nanoelectronics, the biosensors. I've been in the hospital a lot in the past couple weeks, and I've been amazed at what they do with sensors. Instead of having the up periscope or down periscope, you can swallow the cameras to go see what's inside you these days. It sends the signal out, they collect it, you get rid of the camera, it's disposable, thankfully, and go on from there. <laughs> Much less invasive. Uh, molecular nanotechnology and microelectronic mechanical systems. Everything from the airbag the sensors in your car to little tiny motors so small you can't see them without uh, scanning electron microscope. So RIT's got a pretty unique program as one of the, a couple of years ago they were the only undergraduate program in microelectronics. I still believe they're the only one completely focused on microelectronics. It's a subset of the EE and science departments where for five year program, where one year is on co-op, you really work on a focus in microelectronics. You start off with your basis in electrical engineering but by the time you're done, you really wouldn't make a good electrical engineer. You'd have a lot more courses to do. You do a lot in material science and a lot in lithography, optics. But it's all tailored to making tiny little computer chips, many, many of them very, very quickly and very, very cheaply. Um, a couple of years ago, a couple of years ago, eight years ago or so, they added a master's program. And a few years ago, they added a PhD program. They also have options for masters and bachelors at the same time, and also doing different minors that uh, correspond to material science as well as microelectronics. The problem is, if you go into any of the modern fabrication facilities, the plants to make computer chips, they are huge and they are expensive. Five billion dollars is the rough cost of the Global Foundries plant that's here in New York. Five billion, that's one plant. Mm -hmm. It is. Just think of the depreciation on these plants, considering they have a typical lifetime of maybe four years. I started off working at Samsung in Austin, Texas. If a piece of equipment went down that stopped our production line, you did not go home. They brought you a pillow and a cup. Not that you were allowed to use it. If the weather was bad, if you were sick and your equipment needed work, they sent somebody to get you. The depreciation on the equipment was that expensive millions of dollars every time something stops. You're putting out so much product so quickly, 
and it becomes obsolete so fast. It's a very, very high paying, very competitive industry that goes a million miles an hour. So they need very qualified people who know what they're doing. And if you look, in the 1980s, the different jobs you might find in a fab, from fab manager, the boss, to an engineering manager, a typical process engineer, um, associate engineers, all the way down to technicians and operators, you could become an operator with a high school education. Associate's degree would get you into a technician job. Bachelor's degree, typical process engineer, and by the time you got your master's, you were probably looking at the management position. Not so anymore. Now, high school diploma doesn't get you in the door. Associate's degree gets you into the operations area. A bachelor's degree gets you to a tech job. And a master's degree is where you start to become a full process engineer. So you have this sinking arrow of education, a problem where, if you think about it, bachelor graduates really need a master's degree to enter this field and become a what we would consider a typical engineer which requires one to two more, year, more years in school, all for maybe $5,000 a year extra at the starting salary. That's not a very good investment when you think about it from the student's perspective. Or the other option is to go back and look at the K-12 curriculum and see, hey, can we start these kids a little bit sooner? Give them a leg up on everybody else so that they can <coughs> at this accelerated pace. And RIT opted to really focus on that second solution. They established an outreach office in the microelectronics department with a director and coordinator. The uh, original coordinator is a physics teacher now at Honeyoy. Um, develops and delivers program for K-12 to K-12 constituents, and they prefer to teach teachers. They have come in and talked to different physics classes, students, all the way from, I think, sixth grade was the youngest up through 12th grade. But really, if they want to get the most bang for the buck, we decided we're going to focus on the teacher because they have the most face time with the students. So they started an outreach initiative where they would bring teachers in for a workshop, one or two weeks. They'd come into the RIT microelectronics department, and half the day they would spend in a little lecture hall, something like this, talking about the theory, how to teach some of these things at different levels, what the excitement was, the career opportunities, and the other half of the time they would actually spend in RIT's fabrication facility building chips. And it was a neat program, and they got a lot of good feedback from the students. Teachers said it was valuable, but the implementation, when they went back to the classroom, feedback later on, a year or two down the road, said the implementation was tough. The most popular item was the 30-minute video that covered the industry, a little synopsis of the entire program that a lot of the teachers would show during study halls, or they'd keep it running during lunch times, things like that. But the bulk of the time they spent here didn't get a lot of practical use. The teacher said they had to teach to the test, especially when we have a Regents program in New York, where the Regents program, the test ends on the basically the last day of school. There wasn't a lot of free time in those last couple weeks where you might think, hey, if I've got a week or two, I'd love to go into this. You really need to spend reviewing with the kids. Also, they had a need to develop a full curriculum and doing something where you've only had two weeks of exposure to it, they said it was a little bit daunting. I certainly understand that. And the lack of time to develop the curriculum. So those were some of the challenges. So I've been teaching in microelectronics since 2002, 2003. A couple years ago, after I'd been a physics teacher in high school for a few years, they asked if I would uh, join this program and see what we could do to change this up a little bit along with another physics teacher who was the outreach director and also worked in the microelectronics industry. We looked at identifying some place where we could really fit this in easily in more places than just New York. And we looked at the AP program and said, you know, we have a test around May 11th, 12th of each year. And then what do you do with your kids for the next four to six weeks? A lot of teachers I asked go into all sorts of other topics they would have loved to cover during the year. Well, maybe semiconductors is one of them. And I also found a lot of teachers who said, hey, the kids have worked really hard all year. We're going to go do a bunch of fun projects. We're going to analyze the physics of Star Wars movies or go make videos demonstrating different things or many different ideas, but none of which tied in very tightly to the curriculum or they had a whole lot of love for it. more of a let's find something physics related to keep busy for a couple weeks. So we tried to come up with a program in four to six weeks that would allow the teachers to do microelectronics after the AP exam. 
and that's called the STEP program. There's a link to it here, and when we're done, I'll bring up the website very quickly so you can see some of the materials that are online. The objectives, number one, were to introduce the students to the basic engineering principles. The whole design, build, test cycle, how you would go through that again and again. To talk about the career opportunities, the many different places you can get involved. Everywhere from health, safety, and environment is a big topic in microelectronics to technical marketing, sales. You're not just designing, sitting at a desk, or working in a lab all the time in this industry by any means. Trying to develop a general, deeper understanding of science concept concepts. Developing vocabulary, talking about the different uh, terms you're going to use and becoming familiar with them, especially if you're going to go into an interview for some of these co-op positions later on. Developing skills needed to explore high-tech concepts independently. There's the key word there, trying to teach students to teach themselves, letting them direct their own education in this program. And working productively as part of a team, which I know is a big push in everybody's classroom these days. So the program we came up with is designed to be implemented in one week modules. Each one you could pick and choose a la carte depending on what your students have an interest in. One or two periods of each week are dedicated to hands-on work of some sort the unit usually begins with an introductory discussion. I try not to call it a lecture because if you're talking most of the time in this program, you're probably not doing it right. The kids know more than, they definitely know more than I do anytime I start bringing these things up. What are the applications? Where do you see this? What's the latest and greatest? If you can get them to really drive that discussion, you've got them engaged. Uh, then some group exploration through resources, activities, sometimes it's simulation, sometimes it's hands-on work, sometimes it's even doing something like a web quest where they go on the computer and try and research these things themselves. And you can differentiate instruction through not just the level of independence the students work with, but the depth that you want them to go into. I've done a subset of this with my Regents Physics class and they really enjoyed it. I do the same thing with my APC class, but they drill much, much, much deeper. In both cases, it came across fairly well. And the modules are designed so you could pick which ones you really want to use. If there's something your kids don't have an interest in, hopefully you can skip that and go on to something they do have an interest in. And the other trick to implementing in a high school classroom is resources. We've got a $5 billion fab required to make computer chips. What can you do in your classroom? So our goal was to make this as cheap and easy to implement as possible. Things like computers with internet access, Optimally, you'd have one for every two students. I know that's awfully tough to do in many classrooms, but uh, you could do this with three or four students per computer. You just have to really work to try and keep the kids engaged in different ways, have them working on separate things, have half the kids in the front of the room, back and forth. As far as hands-on lab materials, things like string, glue, paper, where we're modeling computer chips instead of actually building them out of silicon. Um, no required texts. The entire text that would be required comes from a chapter of Honors Physics Essentials, and I put the entire chapter online. So there's a link to the chapter, a uh, shortcut to it as well, if that's a little bit much to type. And if you want the book, you can go find it. The author's a little bit shaky there, you can see. But, uh, but it's all online, no need to go buy anything. We've developed four modules so far. Integrated circuits, which is kind of the introduction. PN junctions or diodes, having students work through qualitatively how a diode works. And that's probably the most challenging. Once they've got the diode down, transistors and everything else, everything else comes pretty easily. Transistors and digital logic, taking them from a PNP or NPN transistor, a CMOS transistor, and then turning that into an AND gate, a NOR gate, and putting those together up to the point of maybe having a basic VCR type counter. And finally, how you build these things, integrated circuit fabrication. And that's the one that I usually end up with because my kids love that. When we talk about all the applications of physics that go into each of these steps required to make a computer chip, and how you really take these concepts that have been so uh, ethereal for them and tie them in the extreme into some practical application is pretty neat. You talk about ion implanters that are implanting with energies of mega electron volts they get really excited. So a sample module, and again, if you guys want, you can go look at this on this website. We'll post this to the uh, to the Raptor page, the presentation, if that's okay with you. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. 
Um, things like course notes, besides the book, which is sometimes a little unfriendly for students to read. When I taught it once, I recorded all the notes I put directly on the board, so you could see exactly what we go through step by step as we talked about different uh, different aspects of the uh, of the program. Here we're building a PN junction, a diode, and talking about how things go from one side to the other, all without getting involved in any heavy math. Also, use a bunch of simulations online. The vet.colorado.edu site is a wonderful place for students, and they've got a couple simulations that'll help with semiconductor basics. And there are a couple more as well, molecular courseware, I think it's called, and a few others that we reference in here. And the general idea is, we've tried this for a couple years in my classroom and in one other physics teacher's classrooms, and a few other teachers throughout the country have tried pieces of it. In general, they've said it's been pretty successful, they really like it, but they would like more teacher training not surprised at all. Again, if you've only seen this once or haven't had a chance to do it hands-on, it's awfully tough to go translate that to a bunch of students who, if you guys are in a classroom like mine, especially in the AP classes, every student is smarter than me when they walk in there and they know it. <laughs> so, general idea is try and make an easily adoptable program with pre-built modules that, once you're familiar with the program, even if you're not comfortable with it, you could lay it out where the students have enough independence that they should be able to figure it out with just a little bit of guidance. Also, try and build in time and resources for teachers to expand this. Instead of just a few of us building it, what if we could get all the program participants to help build and enhance it? So RIT is working on developing a multi-week summer training program, stipended of course, that would include on-campus training, several weeks here on campus, uh, going through the basics of semiconductors, actually building them in the fab so you've got the hands-on experience of how you could actually do this. You've seen the equipment, you've seen how it works. And then also including roughly 50% of the time to go develop activities and program materials that you would actually use in the classroom. You're not here for three weeks where you're sitting in lectures <coughs> taking notes and then going home and putting that in your basement. Half your time is actually building lesson plans that you're going to use, building lab you're all set, put in a cardboard box, pull out at the end of the year, and you're set to go, and sharing that with other people. So the current status is that that's been submitted to the NSF as a grant request. That happened you know, middle, early of last year. It's still in status of pending, which from what I hear is good news. As long as it's not rejected, pending is a very good status to be in with the NSF, especially when we're overdue by a little bit for hearing a response. And we're looking to find folks who might be interested should this go through. And we're actually fairly hopeful that this will come through probably for the following year to start this up. So, any questions? I should have said to begin with, please interrupt any time. But yes, sir. Uh, I teach electronics and I love it and my students love it. I mean, microelectronics, semiconductors. Uh, great. Um, <clears throat> if this is if a lot of us have, you know, if we see value uh, passed on to our students in this program, should we not lobby the powers that be that make, you know, like statewide standards that, that uh, suppress this kind of innovation? I don't know as I would quite say suppress while I'm on uh, camera. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I think. I'll tell you what. <laughs> you want to turn it off. <laughs> what should we be afraid of? I, I mean, uh, uh, I look at some of the things in our different curriculums and wonder why in the world is this piece here as opposed to this? When yeah, yeah, yeah. Every yeah. Day. None of my kids want to shoot a monkey falling out of a tree. They would all like to shoot a laser at uh, a solar cell, you know, and transmit sound or something. You know, and build your own solar cells. Yes, I would highly recommend it. I have sent more than one or two letters and gotten the standard thank you for and for your input responses, but we recommend keep that up, absolutely. All right, then very quickly let me go show you where this is. Aplusphysics.com and under Educators Step Program. There's the outline 
outcomes, and each module has a basic idea of what's included there. So the introductory, introductory one has a web quest where students spend roughly one period, has them go through, figure out the cost of a fab, the smallest transistor on there, compare that to the wavelength of light, and talk about why you can't see it with an optical microscope, things like that. Then they look at the, pro the industry itself, the different careers. Uh, lecture discussion on some of the basics and the introductory one it has to be a little bit more lecture than I'd like at this point just to really give everybody a firm foundation. And then they do an integrated circuit modeling lab where they build up the different layers on construction paper with scissors, glue, string for the metal, metal wires, things like that. And you can keep going through and seeing the different pieces. All the other detailed material is on there, the step-by-step -step derivation, PN junction diodes, transistors, digital logic, and NOR inverters. Some carries for an adder or a half adder there, I think. Processing and fabrication, all the different steps, etch, clean, lithography, plasmas, then film deposition, atomic layer deposition. Um, cross sections of all the steps so you can hopefully see in your mind as you go through each step from a cross section as well as a top view what's happening. And the part I really like is the lab with the Legos. Gotta love Legos in physics classes where they build it up step by step and it includes the instructions, what pieces you need, how to go build it and each of the different colors represents different materials, things like that. So trying to make this as practical and hands-on as we can. All right, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. All right, thank you very much for your time.